All right. Good afternoon, and thank you for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission today. My name is Lori, and I will be managing this session. We are fortunate to be joined today by Mark Turnett, the black bear biologist for the Pennsylvania Game Commission, and he'll be talking to us about what Pennsylvania black bears are up to this time of year. We expect the presentation to last about 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer period of about 10 to 15 minutes. You can ask a question by typing into the type question here box on the GoToWebinar control panel, probably at the right of your screen. For those of you that may be dialing in by phone today, please note that this is not a toll-free call and you may receive long-distance charges from your service provider. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Turnett. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, would you like to share a little bit about your background before we get started? Uh, certainly. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. My name is Mark Turnett. I'm the black bear biologist with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. I've been with the Game Commission now for about 16 years. Uh, and as the black bear biologist, I'm responsible for research and management and monitoring of our bear populations statewide. And uh, so today what we're going to be talking about is uh, springtime ecology of Pennsylvania black uh, Spring is a, a fascinating time and a very interesting time for bears. They're just coming out of hibernation. Um, some of the foods that they utilize in early spring are uh, unique, and a lot of people wouldn't think of them as typical bear foods. Uh, spring is also the time of year when you have dispersal. Uh, bears moving out into new areas, and it's also uh, the time when the breeding season starts to ramp up, with the breeding season occurring around uh, the 1st of June. So uh, spring is very interesting, very important time for bears, and um, that's what today's topic is going to be for the webinar. So to get started, uh, okay, uh, to get started, um, if you look at uh, the range of the North American, of the American black bear in North America, you'll see that they're really distributed all over the continent. Uh, in the lower 48 states, you know, there currently there's thought to be about 40 states that have uh, some small to large bear populations. And what's unique is that uh, because they occur just about everywhere in lower uh, 48 states, especially a lot of varied habitats, you'll see that uh, Pennsylvania occurs right in the middle of the mid-Atlantic uh, region. We, are, we sit right in the middle of the Appalachian Range, uh, the Bear Range that kind of extends from northern Georgia into Maine. And so we, uh, we really are uh, an important spot for bears here in the eastern U.S. If you look at where bears occur uh, across North America, uh, it really stands out that they use a lot of different habitats. Um, you can go to the Rocky Mountains in the, in the west, and it's a kind of a high elevation pine forest. And in the Pacific Northwest, it's almost a temperate rainforest. But here in the east, in Pennsylvania, it's mostly deciduous oak forest. And the, and the reason I start this uh, presentation today with habitat is because habitat really determines what food is available to a bear. Um, the type of habitat that, that a bear lives in will determine how much food and what types of food and how easy it is to find those foods uh, in the spring. And so in Pennsylvania, since we have deciduous oak forest, there's a there's a couple points that are important here we should mention in the beginning. And one is that, that these oak forests that we have in Pennsylvania are abundant throughout the state. You know, nearly nearly three-quarters of the state is forested. And so we do have a lot of oak forest habitat uh, throughout the, the state that bears can use. And these forests provide a lot of different types of food. Where, because of where we sit in that mid-Atlantic region, our forests are, are relatively diverse. And they have a lot of different types of foods. Um, that bears can rely on. That, that's a lot different than uh, places that would be north of here in the in kind of the northern bear range. And finally, um, the type and abundance of foods that the forest we have in Pennsylvania, um, those foods fluctuate seasonally. You know, because we have a lot of different types of foods, um, bears have to switch from one type of food to another as they uh, become seasonally abundant. So you might start in the spring with one type of food, and switch to another food in, in late spring, and then yet other group of foods as summer begins. And um, that's an important thing because that really influences uh, bear biology this time of year. And finally, um, as, I, as I hinted, food influences spring behavior. Uh, these bears are coming out of hibernation now, and so uh, they need to find food uh, to kind of recover from that hibernation period 
and what food is available and how easy it is to find is going to influence a lot of their behavior this time of year. So to kind of start off, let's talk a little bit about hibernation um, because that is kind of the precursor to, to spring bear biology. Um, in, it influences the condition of the bears in the spring. You have to think that, that these bears have been in a state of hibernation. Some will be almost four to five months. Uh, during that time, they're not eating or drinking anything. And so the length of hibernation and when hibernation ends will determine um, what condition the bear is in the spring. It also determines when that spring activity will begin. So when hibernation ends is when the bears start to emerge, and that's when we start to see a lot of movement of bears in the spring. So I'll, I'll mention here in a minute kind of when that occurs in Pennsylvania. So uh, and hibernation, when, does, uh, when do bears enter hibernation in Pennsylvania? Well, it varies by sex and age and reproductive group. So if a, depending on how old you are as a bear, whether you're a male or a female, or whether you're with cubs or without cubs, that year will determine when you enter hibernation. Uh, most of our pregnant females in the fall will begin hibernating in mid-November, and it may last all the way into early December. Um, females with cubs from a year uh, that are a year old will tend to be a little later, maybe late November into mid-December. Um, your subadult male and female bears, these are your solitary bears, young bears, uh, they tend to be a little later, starting around the 1st of December, and then adult males can be any time in late November to, to late December. So it varies by sex and age group, but it also varies by year, and that's what these blue bars represent, is that it's not the same year after year. Some years, bears will den earlier, and some years, bears will den later, and that has a lot to do with, with food conditions in the fall, and that, that would be a good topic for maybe a future webinar. But I'll just mention that it does vary seasonally and by sex and age group. So when do bears come out of hibernation? When does this kind of springtime start for bears? Well, again, you can see that it varies by sex and age group, and it also varies by year. And so these female bears that have gone into hibernation pregnant in the fall are the first to come out, or the last to come out of den, um, and they usually come out of their dens late March, uh, early April. Adult males, on the other hand, may start to leave dens uh, in early March, and almost are always out by the 1st of April. So for a bear, and a, a springtime usually starts sometime around the end of March, early April, when they leave, leave the den. Now think about this for a moment, that these females that were pregnant going into the dens in the fall, they, have, they will spend up to five months of the year in a state of hibernation. Uh, during that time, they won't eat, they won't drink anything, and they won't produce any waste. And if they're pregnant going in in the fall, they'll produce cubs in the winter, and they'll nurse those cubs daily throughout the winter. So all of this adds up to a tremendous um, nutritional drain on the bear during hibernation. And the general number that's given is that a bear will lose up to 30% of its body weight during hibernation. Um, that's not bad considering they haven't eaten for five, for five months. And that's due to a low metabolic rate. But when you think about that, and you also consider that um, in Pennsylvania, a lot of dens are relatively uh, unsheltered. They're open on the ground. We get a lot of bears that den out in the uh, open and may, like I said, may be there for four to five months. It's not surprising that come spring when these bears emerge from the dens, um, they start, they need, need to start to find food. Um, they've gone for a long period without food. They've been relying on their fat reserves and now they need to leave that den in the spring and start to find uh, something to eat. And uh, this time of year actually is, is sometimes called a negative foraging period or a deficit period for bears because they end up spending more energy looking for food than what they get from the food that they find. And that's because there's just not a lot available in the spring. Uh, early spring is still pretty bleak on the landscape here in Pennsylvania. As you can see in this picture, there's not a whole lot out there uh, for a bear that needs to go out and find food uh, to actually be successful at finding. And unfortunately, because of that, because bears that need to go out and start to find food early in the spring and often uh, may not find much available, we do start to see our nuisance bear activity increase, start to creep up in about uh, the 1st of April. And this is due to those bears getting out there looking for food and, um, and not finding it in the woods and, and going back to the place where they last remember food being available, and often that will be near people. 
No, because they're now out looking for something to eat and, and there's not a lot available on the landscape, um, these bears will start to travel and travel has its risks. Um, the more that a bear uh, is out there searching for food, the more likely it is to encounter things that, that are potentially dangerous. Vehicle collisions start to creep up in early spring. Um, we also see you know, of other chance threats that bears might encounter. Um, because they need to find that food, um, often they're maybe willing to take uh, risks that they might not normally take at other times of the year if food was more abundant. So springtime starts off um, at a bit of a risk for bears, but they need to, to take those risks in order to, to start to replace the, the energy that they've lost over the winter. So what, what do bears eat in the springtime? Um, if you look at a bear's diet, and you look at the adaptation that bears have, almost everything about a bear can be tied back to its ability to find food. Um, how, they're, how they're shaped, how they're, how they're built, um, their life history, their reproductive strategies, even their teeth are really adapted to an omnivorous diet, their ability to find food. If you look at their teeth, they look a lot like our own. They're very flat, uh, the molars are flat, and that's designed for grinding, um, a vegetation and fruits and nuts and so bears do have a very um, varied diet with a high percentage of uh, vegetation in their diet probably higher than most other carnivores and so in the spring vegetation is probably one of the key foods and when these bears are leaving dens the first thing they start to look for is any place that's greened up early and that's usually along uh, riparian areas or stream corridors um, or maybe a lot of, um, in the woods you'll find vernal pools or wetlands or low-lying low areas that are wet in the spring. These areas are often the first to green up and uh, the first where bears can find food in the spring. And so these are very important and they provide a lot of different types of foods early in the spring for bears. Um, grasses that emerge early in the spring are one of the important foods early on. Um, it's not hard to see these, you know, if you go to these vernal pools in the springtime, you'll see that it's the only green vegetation around. Uh, things like sedges uh, that emerge relatively early in these wet areas are, are an important food uh, early in the spring for bears. But here's a surprising one to a lot of people, and that's skunk cabbage. Uh, skunk cabbage is a large leaf plant that is very common uh, in these wet areas, and if you ever have the opportunity to break off a stalk of this stuff and smell it, you'll, you'll understand why it's called skunk cabbage. But um, it is an important food to bears in the spring, and it's, it's widely available. It occurs just about everywhere in the state in these wet areas. It's a very concentrated food source. Once bears find it, they don't have to, to travel very far um, to find more food, and it's very abundant. Um, you know, if you take a hike in early April, mid-April, um, this type of vegetation stands out. You can recognize it very easily. But a very important food, probably the most important food for bears in early spring here in Pennsylvania. Now, a couple other things that bears eat that time of year that might surprise you. Um, leftover acorns, uh, particularly if it was a good mass crop the year before, you'll find areas where acorns have uh, kind of gathered often along the, the sides of uh, an old forestry road or a dirt road. You'll get the in the ditch where the leaves have accumulated over winter, you'll get areas where acorns will gather and you'll see bears along the roads digging those acorns out of the ditches or the, uh, the water diversion areas. Also scavenging of uh, winter killed deer. Um, deer that have died over the winter due to whatever condition in the winter or maybe were hit by vehicles over the winter, when they thaw in the spring, uh, we do know that bears will scavenge on those carcasses. So that's a, a source of protein early in the winter. Here's another surprising one, and that is uh, flowers or buds on trees in the springtime. Uh, particularly aspen is an important tree that does this or provides a food for bears. These are uh, a sow with a cub in an aspen tree, and you can see that the bear is foraging on these uh, the emerging flowers and leaves, uh, particularly uh, the trees like aspen and willow that have these long kind of flower-like structures that are called catkins. This is an important food for bears in the spring. Um, even before the leaves come on, um, you'll see bears up in the trees uh, feeding on these. And then as uh, spring progresses, uh, the bears will start to drift away from these kind of early um, spring habitats and will move out more into the upland landscape and they'll start to feed on, on emerging forest plants. This is an example of a, a fiddlehead or a fern that's emerging. Um, that's an important food uh, in kind of mid-spring. 
Other forbs that, it, that start to come up early in the spring, things like Jack in the Pulpit, uh, which is an example here. Uh, these are, again, forbs that are coming up out in the forest. The bears will start to, to eat and utilize as a food source. And you'll see that there's a steady progression in, in plant diversity and volume in the diet as it becomes available. And so by late May, uh, early June, uh, the vegetation is now a very high percentage of a bear's diet. And uh, this is an example of clover, that clover is a very uh, important food early in the spring. Um, you'll see bears out on uh, right-of-way pipelines or gas lines or maybe uh, agriculture areas where there's clover. You'll see bears at dusk and dawn out there feeding on that. Now, another uh, important food source in the spring is insects. Uh, if you take a walk in uh, April or May and you'll notice in the woods uh, logs that have been torn up or rocks that have been flipped over, stumps that have been disturbed, th this is a sign of bears uh, searching for insects. And what they're doing, they're actually, they'll eat the insects, but they're actually eating the eggs or the pupae. Um, and they will also even um, raid in bees' nests, uh, nests that are in the ground, like a yellow jacket nest in the ground, or maybe a cavity bee, like these honeybees. And so insects are a very important food source, uh, protein, uh, high in calories uh, for bears in the spring, to kind of supplement the vegetation they have in their diet. And of course, another source of protein is fawn predation. Um, fawn predation really peaks around the, the 1st of June when fawns start to be born here in Pennsylvania. And in 2002, uh, the Game Commission conducted a study on fawn predation to kind of get a, a feel for just how significant of a factor is it um, from bears. And some of the things, some of the highlights from that study, and, and there's actually another study being repeated uh, right now looking at this same question again. But looking at the 2002 results, um, some of the highlights are that bears cause about a third or 33 percent of predatory deaths. That's uh, second only to coyotes here in Pennsylvania in terms of predation on, on fawns. But you have to keep in mind that only about 22% or about one in five fawns are actually killed by predators. So in other words, around 80% of fawns um, will not die due to predation. Uh, only about 22% or about one in 20 or one in five have a chance of being killed by a predator. And so if you look at these two numbers together and ask yourself, okay, if I'm a fawn, What's the odds that I'll be uh, killed by a predator and that that predator will be a bear? The answer is that it's about 7%. So bears will kill about 7% of fawns. Um, but what's really interesting is that that predation occurs very early in the fawn's life. Um, usually about the first couple weeks after a fawn is born, um, the behavior of the fawn is to lay still and try to hide from predators. And it's during that period is when most of the bear predation occurs. Once fawns become more mobile and start to run from predators, um, bears really give up uh, feeding on them and, and will switch over to other foods that are available. You know, bears are a bit lazy in that regard. If they, if they can find other foods that become available that are easier to find or easier to acquire and they don't have to expend as much energy, then you'll see the switching over. And so that's why fawn predation drops off so dramatically about two to three weeks into the, into the life cycle of a fawn. And so the question is, you know, would, fawn, would more fawns survive into the fall population if bear populations were lower? And because the bear predation occurs so early in the fawn's life, we, that's really a question we, we, have, we really don't have the answer for. Because if bears were uh, eliminated from the equation, the odds that those fawns would die due to some other factor before reaching the fall population is still pretty high because that bear predation occurs so early in the fawn's life. And then as you move away from uh, kind of mid-June into uh, mid-June mid -June through early July, uh, as, er as summer starts to really get here, that's when you see bears switch over to a lot of fruits. Uh, and this is where Pennsylvania really kind of stands out here in the east. Our forests provide a tremendous diversity of fruits available to bears. You know, in, in this uh, slide here, we have an example of blueberries and blackberries. Uh, we have several cherry uh, species out there, pin cherry, choke cherry, and fire cherry that all produce food for bears. And in the lower left corner there, you have uh, sassafras fruit. And so there's really a large variety of fruits out there. And so this is when bears really start to do well um, in order of finding food. There's so much available and so much diversity that if any one of these particular foods don't fare very well that year, there's still something else for bears to eat. 
And of course, uh, in the springtime, bears will use other foods that are found near people. Um, and as I mentioned in the beginning, that's why we start to see nuisance bear problems increase in the spring, is because these bears are also looking for food where they last remember it, and often that'll be uh, near residential areas, either bird feeders or garbage cans. So that, that's kind of a, a quick overview on the types of foods and how they change through the spring uh, for a bear. But now I'll talk a little bit about other aspects of spring bear ecology. Um, in this picture, you can see there's a, it's actually in the far ground, in the background there, there's a, you can just barely make out the face of, a, of an adult bear uh, at the edge of the opening. Uh, that's a mother, and what you see in the closer in the picture are three yearlings. So um, family breakup or the, the separation of yearlings from the, the mother starts to occur in mid-May to early June. It's right before the breeding season. Um, we know that uh, this family dispersal occurs uh, every year, and as I mentioned, shortly before the breeding season, uh, these yearlings are actually forcefully driven off by the mother. So you can imagine, uh, for these yearling bears, this is a pretty traumatic experience. Um, they have just spent the last 18 months uh, with their mother, and now the only caregiver that they've ever known will now forcefully chase them away, so that she can breed again and produce cubs the following year. So these yearlings are now moving out on their own mid-May to early June. Um, and what's interesting is that male yearlings will leave the area where they're born in, but females, on the other hand, almost settle very close to where their mother lives. So you'll get this dispersal of male yearling, young juvenile male bears, moving out onto the landscape and looking for a place to call their own. And often these uh, yearling males, they've they really haven't had an opportunity to become established uh, in the dominance of the local bear population. And so they'll try to avoid other bears. And it's often in doing that, they find themselves in, in kind of unusual places or suboptimal habitats. And, and that's why these bears that we see uh, in late May and early June that show up in really unusual areas like downtown Scranton or, or State College or any of these urban centers, these are usually yearling males that are dispersing, um, moving out, trying to find a place of their own, and um, in doing so, they find themselves in these unusual places. And as I mentioned, these dispersing yearlings during that time can become involved with a lot of nuisance bear problems. And we know that uh, that's the case because if you look at the timing of nuisance bear conflicts, and this graph demonstrates what per on, a, on a weekly basis, what percent of the annual conflicts occur in each week. And you can see that they, they rise very quickly beginning you know, around late March, early April, and they peak right around the 1st of June. So right now, here we are coming up on um, late May, coming into the early June. Uh, we are at or very close to the peak nuisance bear at period here in Pennsylvania. And that also corresponds to that dispersal period where all these yearling males are now hitting the landscape, um, starting to move out looking for a place of their own. And this all occurs just prior to the, be the breeding season. Uh, the breeding season for bears in Pennsylvania will begin right around uh, early June and will extend into, into mid-July. And we know that about 50% or 46% of adult female bears breed during 11th of June, between the 11th of June and the 20th of July. And so dis uh, this male dispersal is kind of winding down a little bit and the breeding season is ramping up uh, in late spring, early summer. And during that breeding season, um, there's some interesting things going on. One is that um, these adult bears, they will start to increase their daily travel distances. In other words, the, the amount of miles that they will cover during a day will increase, both for males and females. They will use uh, greater portions of their home range during that period of the year. In other words, um, during that uh, four-week period of the breeding season, a bear might visit more of its home range than it would at any other time of the year. Oh, you start to see increased activity during daylight hours. And so if you like to, to see bears, I always tell people your best opportunity is usually around the first week of July because that's when bears are spending more time traveling, and especially during daylight hours. And both sexes are polygamous. In other words, males are breeding with multiple females, and females are breeding with multiple males. Now, these female bears are typically only breeding every other year. Um, they'll, as I mentioned, they stay with the, their young for about 18 months before uh, the young are forced away. But in this picture, um, this was in fact a picture that was just sent in this spring. 
and it shows a, a female bear with a cub and a yearling in the same frame. And so the cub, you can see he's climbing on the side of the, of the mother and the yearling's at her feet. And so there are, in very rare occasions, um, you will get females that breed every year and will actually have uh, a cub and yearlings with her at the same time. This is very unusual. Um, I've only ever uh, seen it once before here in Pennsylvania, but I do know in talking to uh, other biologists in other states that it is documented occasionally, and so it does happen um, every now and then. So, so how can we put uh, all this information together? And we know we know kind of what bears are eating this time of year. We know how important food is to them. We know about dispersal activity and the breeding season. How can we put all this information to use and avoid conflicts with bears in the springtime? Well, you know, it should be pretty clear that one of them is eliminating food attractants. Uh, because food is so important to bears in the spring, um, they actually uh, need to find food to recover from that hibernation period and that they're willing to take risks that they may not take at other times of the year. Um, they are prone uh, to being attracted into residential areas and so eliminating any food attractant could go a long ways into preventing problems with bears. Um, and the other thing that I think is important to mention is that it is natural to see these juvenile bears in these unusual places as they, as they disperse. Um, and often these are just transients, they're moving through, trying to establish an area, and it's important to prevent the learning of unwanted behaviors while they're doing that. So in other words, if you've if been successful at removing attractants around your home, that when these young bears are dispersing through the area, if they don't find anything to eat, odds are they won't come back. And so you can really prevent future problems with bears, not only prevent um, problems or eliminate problems today, but prevent problems down the road by um, preventing these juvenile bears from getting access to food and learning to associate people with food in the springtime. And, we, and the reason we know that that can be very successful or very important is because in 2008 we did a survey of Pennsylvania residents. We asked people, you know, if you have had a problem with a bear, what um, did that involve? And nearly 50% of the conflicts that people have with bears involve bird feeders. 40% involve garbage. And so those can be uh, corrected through adequate uh, garbage disposal or garbage storage. Simply taking down your bird feeders in the springtime before these bears come out of hibernation can go a long way with re to remove attractants and prevent problems with bears in the springtime. So I think uh, to kind of, um, if you were to wrap this up with, with kind of one uh, slide, I think you, it's easy to say that, that spring and summer, or spring and early summer, are in a very important time in a bear's life. You know, they're recovering from hibernation, they're dispersing, they're beginning the breeding season, they're using a variety of different foods that change almost weekly depending on availability. But it's also a very important time for people who live with bears. This is probably the most important time out of the year. To, um, to be aware of what is in your yard that might attract bears so that you can prevent problems with bears down the road in your neighborhood. And I think uh, we'll just end there. And for more information on uh, Pennsylvania black bears, um, you can go to our website, www.pgc.pa.gov. Thank you. Any questions? All righty. So I'd like to invite anybody that has a question to go ahead and type it into the sidebar in your go-to webinar control panel. Um, I have a question. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about um, bears with ear tags? Sometimes they have one, sometimes they have two. Are they just metal? That, that's an, uh, an excellent question because we get, we get that often. Somebody will see a bear, it has one ear tag, and they'll say, well, that bear was just caught once. And then they'll see a bear with two ear tags, and they'll say, well, that bear was caught twice. And the reality is, is that that's incorrect. Um, every bear that we capture and handle, whether it's for research or whether it's for uh, a, nu a nuisance activity, each bear that we put our hands on will get an ear tag in each ear. And so if you see a bear with only one ear tag, all that really means is that it's lost its other ear tag. Um, so every bear out there that we handle gets an ear tag. Every ear tag has a unique number on it. No two ear tags have the same number. And so um, if you were ever fortunate enough to, to see a bear with ear tags up close, maybe at a, at a check station or during one of our research activities, you can look at that number and we can look that up just 
the same as looking up uh, your social security number. That's that bear's ID. Now this year we are uh, starting uh, in a specific research project up in the north central part of the state that will be using some color coded ear tags. And these will be um, used to identify um, specific bears in some trail camera work that we're going to be doing in these research areas. And so there is an opportunity that somebody might see a bear with a colored ear tag. Um, they, might, they could be uh, one of seven different colors. They'll be plastic. And if you see something like that, um, that bear is associated with that very specific research project. And it doesn't mean anything else other than that bear was captured in one of those research areas. So that's, that's kind of the story on ear tags. Um, every year we, we capture an ear tag, almost 800 bears a year across the state. So it's not that uncommon to see one. So if we would come across an ear tag at a check station, is there information we can learn from the, from the number? Yeah, we, we tell hunters um, after the season ends to, to give our Harrisburg office a call, uh, or uh, you can also through email or through uh, the, our website leave a comment um, and give us the, net, the number that's on that ear tag. We'll look it up. We'll get back to you and tell you where that bear was trapped, why it was trapped, where it was released. We can give you the whole history report. Uh, on that animal if you give us that ear tag number. Very cool. Andrea has a question. She wants to know, how is mange affecting the bear population in Pennsylvania? Yeah, mange, you know, is a, is a debilitating disease. It affects the skin. It's, a, it's caused by a mite that burrows into the skin. Um, we know if mange has been in Pennsylvania since the early 90s. Um, if you look back through our all of our research records, um, most of our cases of mange uh, kind of began in that center, Huntington, Blair County area, and have been slowly expanding across the state. Today, we have uh, mange all the way in our bear population, all the way from the New York line down to uh, the Maryland line, for the most part, um, west of uh, Lycoming County, so the north central and the western half of the state. So it's a, it's a condition that's been in the population now for coming up on over 20 years. Um, so we do know that some bears, um, will not survive uh, mange. We do know that it is a mortality factor, but uh, yet we we don't see a, a real response in our bear population due to that. So it, right now, we don't believe it to be a, uh, a population level issue, um, but it can have um, a significant local issue. In other words, we get, like most diseases that move through the landscape, you'll get areas that where it flares up and it'll become uh, much more common and then, it'll, and then it'll subside, move into another area. And so depending on where you are in the state, you could be in one of these areas that's having more cases than usual or in an area that is just recovering from that. Um, but yet we don't see really any response in our population. Our, our, last year our population estimate was around 20,000 bears statewide. And so we really have not seen any dip in our bear population as mange has um, spread across the state. And, and I think uh, we probably have more questions than answers. Uh, we have... A lot of research right now that's just gearing up, looking at mange, um, trying to make sure we know what species of mite that we're involved with here, looking at some of the genetics of that mite, looking at ways we can treat bears for mange here in the state. So it is a it is a research topic. Uh, we don't have uh, overall concern right now for it in terms of population level. We do want to hear about cases out there. So if you uh, are seeing bears with mange, give your local region office a call. Uh, we want to know about that. Um, and in some cases, we may be able to help those individual bears. Excellent. You touched a little bit on attractants. If a person lives in, in bear country, what are some of the things they can do to um, reduce the attractants at their house? Well, I think the first place to start is bird feeders. And since 50% of the conflicts out there involve bird feeders, um, we, you know, we know now, if you uh, saw in the webinar here, that, that bears begin to emerge from hibernation. Uh, most bears are out by April. So around the 1st of April, you ought to be thinking about taking down your bird feeders if you live in, in areas where bears are, are commonly seen. Um, you know, songbirds really don't rely that heavily on bird feeders for nutrition during the summer months. In the winter months, it's probably more important to the, to the wintering birds. But here in Pennsylvania, um, leaving bird feeders up through the summer really runs the risk of attracting bears. So first off, give serious consideration to taking those feeders down. If you continue to feed birds through the summer, um, at least take your feeders down at night um, or hang them in such a way that they're not accessible to bears. Get them at least 10 feet off the ground and four to six feet from anything a bear can climb. 
Um, also, want to th think about how you store your garbage. Uh, don't put your garbage out curbside until it's ready to be picked up that morning. In other words, don't put it out the night before. Um, try to uh, reduce the amount of uh, food waste that's in your garbage. I know of, I've heard the recommendation that you can, you know, for example, uh, freeze. Uh, food scraps and then the day of garbage, drop that frozen food scraps into your garbage can as opposed to just adding it to your garbage uh, daily. Um, store your garbage cans when they're not being used in a secure shed or a garage. Um, so that anything like that, that you can do to prevent access to garbage goes a long way. Other things like pet foods, take your, uh, if you feed pets outdoors, uh, bring those pet food containers in, in at night. Um, Think about uh, fruit trees or gardens. If you keep, try to keep those areas picked up and clean so that they don't attract bears. Uh, things like compost piles. Try to uh, reduce the amount of food waste that you put in a compost pile in, in, if you happen to have one in your yard. Anything that could be perceived as a potential food attractant, um, I think there are certainly tips you can do to avoid that. Wonderful. Robbie has a question. He asks, can you describe all that happens to a bear when it's trapped? Yeah, so um, there's, there's really two objectives uh, behind uh, catching bears uh, here in Pennsylvania. One is for research purposes. In other words, we want to study those bears for some specific research objective. Uh, maybe it's a, a study of, of bear population, or maybe it's a study of fawn predation. And the other is to uh, address a nuisance bear issue. Maybe we have to catch a bear to relocate it. But when we catch a bear, um, usually what happens is the bear is chemically immobilized. Uh, it's given a, a chemical um, a cocktail through a dart or a jab stick, which is a hole with a needle on the end. The bear is sedated. Uh, once it's under sedation, um, it's unconscious. It's unaware of its surroundings. Um, and so uh, there's really no pain response at that point. And so the bear is in a, sa a state of uh, sedation, much like if you were at a, undergoing a major surgical procedure. And so once we have control of that bear, uh, we then um, we'll, we'll give it a set of ear tags. We'll weigh it. We'll give it a general physical. In other words, we'll uh, look it over to see, you know, what's the body condition? Um, what is it? Uh, what's its uh, fur condition look like? Um, there's a whole series of measurements that we take. Um, we'll collect samples. Uh, often we'll get a blood sample and maybe a hair sample or tissue sample if we're studying a particular disease. Uh, and then um, we'll then we can reverse that bear. There's another um, uh, chemical. Uh, uh, medication or a chemical compound that can be given to the bear um, uh, with a syringe and the bear will start to recover and then it's released. Often, uh, if, if it's for research purposes, the bear will be released right where it was caught. If it's a bear that's being relocated for nuisance work, uh, it might be um, uh, released uh, at the nearest public land. It might, uh, maybe the, the closest state game lands or the closest state forest. Uh, so there's this kind of um, entire process that's pretty much the same for every bear. Um, it takes about 45 minutes to go through that whole process uh, when we get our hands on a bear. Thanks. We have one more question here from Alex. Where can I find and read the complete studies on black bears or other wildlife done by the PGC? Yeah, if you go to our website, the Game Commission website, um, and you go into uh, reports and minutes, uh, there's a section in there, uh, reports, and you go into um, wildlife management reports. And by there, uh, every research project uh, that we do uh, has an annual report associated with it. If it uh, some will have a final report associated with it. And you can go into that report section, and you can um, look up by species or by program area what report you're interested in. And you can um, get the information that way. Uh, you can also, if there's a specific document you need to request, you can send in a request either through uh, email or through our website, through our comment section, and we can get you a copy of that report. But uh, I would start by going into the report section of our webpage, and you'll find a lot of the information right there. Yeah, you can find the reports under the Information and Resources tab, which should be at the top right of the new website screen. And, and I'll mention that the, uh, the bear management plan is a very good document for a lot of that. The, the bear management plan has a very big section in it that covers biology of bears, the history of bear populations in the state, um, and a lot of interesting um, uh, facts about bears. So that's a good document, too, if you're looking for information about bears in Pennsylvania. All right. Jody asked a question about putting slops out back and if they could get fined for doing that if it was attracting bears. Yeah, I assume by slops you're, you're talking about a compost pile or maybe a, some type of waste pile. 
Um, that certainly is a potential attractant for bears. Um, our, our current regulation um, for, uh, for feeding bears um, states that it's uh, illegal to intentionally feed bears. So if you're hand feeding or intentionally trying to attract a bear by placing out food, that certainly is covered by that regulation. But it also uh, addresses indirect feeding of bears. And if indirect feeding is contributing to a nuisance bear problem, in other words, if what you're doing um, is contributing to a nuisance bear problem by attracting bears or congregating bears in that area, and those bears are causing problems in the neighborhood or in the immediate vicinity, then a conservation officer will probably talk to you about it. They, um, they will certainly work with you to try to correct that. Um, you know, this regulation isn't intended to go out and find people, but it's intended to help people and prevent nuisance bear problems. So um, I guess the, the short answer is as long as that's not contributing to a nuisance bear problem, it's um, not directly covered by, by that regulation. But if it is contributed to a bear problem, nuisance bear problem, then that regulation may apply. Excellent. We do have a couple more questions from Carol, Robbie, and Bill. We're going to try to take care of those, and, and then and then I think we'll have to cut it off. So let's see. Carol is asking about tips for tent camping in bear country. Yeah, tent camping, you know, uh, the first thing is do not store food in your tent. Um, most backpacking uh, websites or any type of camping websites, that's one of the first pieces of advice you'll get. Um, if you're camping in a campground that has uh, receptacles where you bear-proof receptacles, you can store food in, certainly use those. If they don't, you can store food in your car, in the trunk of your vehicle, um, in, in a hard-sided camper if you happen to be camping with friends that have a camper, or if you have to, hang your food uh, by a pack in a tree. So I guess the important thing is, you know, no food in the tent, um, store your food outside the tent in such a way that bears can't get to it. Um, also give some thought to how, if you're, if you're in the backcountry or, you know, kind of dispersed camping, give some thought to the site that you're selecting to camp at. Um, you know, try to avoid areas that are along, um, you know, travel corridor that a bear might be using, trails. You know, if you're seeing, if you're hiking on a trail and you're seeing uh, evidence of bears, maybe tracks in the mud or, or sign that bears are using the same trail, then don't camp on that immediate trail. Um, so that's the two big pieces of advice. Keep food out of the tent and um, give some thought to where you set your tent up when you're camping. Sounds good. Uh, Bill has a question. How often do trapped bear return to the area where they were taken? Almost always, Bill. Uh, we know that bears are very good at homing. Um, we don't maybe don't necessarily understand the mechanics of how they do it, um, but we do know that bears are very good at finding their way home. And it doesn't really surprise you when you think about it, because bears spend their are long-lived animals. They have to establish a dominance structure among other bears that they live with. So if you take a bear and you put it in a strange area where instead of having to go through that whole process again, they're naturally going to want to find the, play, their way back to where they feel most comfortable. And so we do know that most bears return. Um, we've looked at relocation data and we know that you have to move a bear at least 100 air miles to really to have no chance of that bear returning. And there's really no place in Pennsylvania where you can take a bear over 100 air miles that doesn't already have bears. And also, uh, in doing that, you increase the odds that that bear is going to get hit by a car or get into trouble on its way home. So really, our current policy or our, our current approach to relocation is to only move bears uh, to the nearest of suitable habitat that's you know nearby public land that's a good place for a bear to live with low conflict potential. So the nearest game lands and nearest state forest. And so relocation really isn't intended to solve the meat to solve the problem permanently. What it's intended to do is to buy you a little bit of time to remove whatever attracted that bear in the first place, whether it's bird feeders or garbage cans or, or corn or whatever it happens to be. And so um, you know, most conservation officers only have one or two traps available, and so they will be selective at where they use that trap at places where the homeowner is willing to work with them to remove that attractant. Because we know that most bears will find their way home, and that relocation is really just a, a tool um, to help address the problem. It's not the ultimate solution. All righty then. One more question here from Robbie. He's curious, is there a negative health effect on a bear if it might consume a deer with CWD? 
you know, CWD is a, a prion disease, and uh, at the moment, uh, all research related to CWD suggests that it only involves animals in the cervid family. So deer, elk, uh, things like that. Um, of course, bears are in the carnivore family, so there's really uh, nothing that w that's ever been documented that we would suspect that would be um, uh, harmful to a bear if it consumed uh, uh, an animal with, that was CWD positive. So um, I guess at the moment, we really don't have any information that would suggest that. But like all of these prion diseases, um, I think there's probably more unknowns about um, what the future holds in terms of these diseases jumping from one species to the other. But everything we know at the moment says that uh, CWD is, is limited to animals in the cervid family. Great. Thanks, Mark. I think we got to everybody's questions today. This session has been recorded, and if everything goes as planned, you should receive an email uh, with a link to the recording in the next few hours. The recording will also be uploaded to the Game Commission's YouTube channel shortly. And I'd like to thank Mark for sharing his experience and time with us today. We'd also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon and hope that you'll visit us again to learn more about Pennsylvania wildlife in upcoming webinars. Webinars. So until then, uh, we hope you're able to get, to get outside and enjoy some of Pennsylvania's great outdoors. Thanks for coming.